where the following sequences determine if they're convergent or divergent, monotonic increasing or decreasing, or bounded. Let's take a look. First example, a sub n equal to cosine of pi n. Now, we can fit a perfectly good function to cosine pi n. If I put x in here, cosine pi x. But that's probably not going to be the best approach. Let's see what happens if we plot the first few points. If I put a 1 in here, I get cosine of pi, which is minus 1. If we put in 2, I get cosine of 2 pi, which is 1. If we put in a 3, I get cosine of 3 pi, which is minus 1. And we notice that this thing's just going to bounce back and forth between minus 1 and 1. So this is going to diverge because it's never going to settle on a given number. It's going to keep bouncing back from minus 1 to 1. Next, let's check monotonic. So let me graph our sequence against the n-axis, subbing in for x. At 1, we'll have minus 1. Next integer 2, we go to 1. Come down, we go to minus 1. Go to 4, we get 1. And it's going to keep going back and forth like this forever. So this can't be monotonic. How would you explain that? Well, the idea is, if at some point my sequence becomes monotonic, once it goes above or below the axis, it's going to have to commit. So let's say, for instance, we thought that this might be an increasing sequence. Well, that would mean once it became increasing and we were above the x-axis, it has to stay above the x-axis. So it's going to commit to being positive. But our sequence here is going to keep going back and forth. It goes positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. So there's no way it could stay increasing. Similarly, there's no way it could stay decreasing. Once I go below the x-axis, when I'm decreasing, I have to stay below the x-axis for all time. So we can't be monotonic. How about bounded? Well, definitely we're bounded above by 2 and below by minus 2. That's because this thing only takes two values, minus 1 and 1. So definitely bounded. For my next example, let's take a look at a sub n equal to cosine n pi over n squared. So we're not going to be fooled by this one. This is really minus 1 to the n over n squared. So let's write the first few terms out. a sub 1 is going to be equal to minus 1. a sub 2 is equal to plus 1 fourth. a sub 3 is equal to minus 1 ninth. So we're going to plot those points. So at 1 we have minus 1, plus 1 fourth, minus 1 ninth. And we can see as we keep pushing out, the sign's going to keep alternating, but the absolute value of the number, just the number itself without the sign, is going to get driven down to 0. So we might guess this thing's going to converge to zero. How would we prove that? Well, that's how we use the squeeze theorem. So note this minus 1 to the n over n squared. Underneath, we can bound it below by minus 1 over n squared. So think of it this way. This function here is going to meet this function about half the time. The other half, this thing's going to shoot up to the positive values. So if we only care about what's happening below, this is taking care of this from, from underneath. If we look up top, well, half the time, this thing's going to be on this function. And so we're looking at 1 over n squared. When it's positive, it agrees with this. When it's negative, it's just shooting down. So this thing is definitely taking care of this thing from above. So now I've squeezed this thing between minus 1 over n squared and 1 over n squared. But we can fit these two sequences to the function minus 1 over x squared and 1 over x squared. And that we can find the limit of. 1 over x squared as x goes to infinity, since that's a positive exponent in the bottom, that's got to go to 0. So that means this goes to 0, this goes to minus 0, which is just 0. And so the sequence that I'm interested in gets sque squeezed down to zero. Could it be monotonic? Okay, not a chance. We saw before, if I'm monotonic increasing or decreasing, once I'm on the correct side of the x-axis, I would have to stay on that side of the axis for all time. Since this thing keeps bouncing back and forth, it gets very small, but it does bounce back and forth. Can't be monotonic. 
Finally, are we bounded? Well, we're bounded above by y equals 1. We're bounded below by, say, y equal 2 minus 2, just so that way this thing's clearly inside a region. So definitely bounded. Okay, let's try one last one. I'm going to go with a sub n equal to natural log n to the 3 halves over n to the 3 halves. My first step, we could pull that exponent down just to make this thing a little bit easier to look at. So I could take the 3 halves. The exponent rule for logarithm says 3 halves up in the exponent comes down to the front as 3 halves. So this is a little bit easier to look at. One thing I could note right off the bat also, so I don't have room to plot points or give you a graph, but we won't need that since this thing behaves pretty well early on. Let's note this is always going to be positive if n is bigger than or equal to 1. Okay, we're not just positive, but non-negative. Why is this? n to the 3 halves is always positive as long as we're looking at a positive number in there. So definitely if we're bigger than or equal to 1. And then we note natural log, if I look at its graph, well, if I put 1 in there, I'm going to get 0. And we know how to plot natural log, 3 points, and an asymptote. Asymptotes at x equals 0. If I put e in there, I'm going to get a 1. If I put 1 over e in there, I get a minus 1. And then I connect the dots. Okay, upshot is, once I get past 1, this thing is completely above the x-axis, meaning y is positive. So this thing here is definitely bigger than or equal to 0 if n is bigger than or equal to 1. That's one small item on our big list that's bounded below by 0. Let's go for convergence and divergence. So if I look at our function, we can fit it to 3 halves natural log of x over x to the 3 halves. That's a perfectly good function. If I do the limit of the top and bottom as x goes to infinity, I'm going to get infinity over infinity, so I can apply Le Hopital's rule. Le Hopital says, just take derivative of the top, put it over derivative of the bottom, and then see where that limit goes. Derivative of the top is 1 over x, derivative of the bottom is 3 halves x to the 1 half. I can clean this up, multiply top and bottom by x over x, and then I can also multiply top and bottom by 2 thirds over 2 thirds. When that cleans up, we're going to have 1 half, 1 over x to the 3 halves. Since I have a positive exponent in the denominator here, that means that this has to go to 0. So we note this sequence converges to 0. So that takes care of our first piece. Now I want to look at monotonic and bounded. We're going to get monotonic by looking at the first derivative test. So the first derivative test will tell us where we're increasing or decreasing. We just need to find a critical point and then check one point on each side of your critical points. I take the derivative, okay, I have the f that I fitted my function to. That's going to give me, pull out the 3 halves. We're using the quotient rule. Derivative of natural log is 1 over x. x to the 3 halves goes in as is, minus natural log of x. Okay, then I take the derivative of x to the 3 halves, which gives me 3 halves x to the 1 half. Whole thing over denominator squared, which is x cubed. To clean up, 3 halves comes out in front as usual. I can pull out, okay, well this is going to turn to x to the 1 half, so I can factor an x to the 1 half out of the top, pull the x cubed out of the bottom, and I'm left with 1 minus 3 halves natural log of x. So the only way this can be 0 is if, well, if I'm at 0 itself, we're going to have a lot of problems, so we don't worry about that. We don't have to worry about that anyway, since natural log won't be defined at 0. What happens here? Well, we want to know where this is 0. So the idea is I want to set natural log of x equal to 2 thirds. That's just pulling that thing apart, set it equal to 0. And then I can get rid of the natural log by raising both sides to the e power. So when is natural log of x equal to 2 thirds? Well, that's going to be at e to the 2 thirds. And that's roughly 1.95 if you go to your calculator. So I have my critical point. Now I want to know where are we increasing and decreasing. Well, increasing we really don't care about since that's early up enough in our function. We would only have to worry about the point n equals 1. When I get to n equals 2, that's when all the stuff that's interesting happens. 
Okay, if I put a 1 in here, we're going to get 3 halves, so it's increasing on this side, but again, not very interesting. We already know that if I put 1 into my sequence, I'm going to get 0. So we have a 0 at 1, and then my next point of interest is going to be at 2. Let's see what's happening on the other side of 1.95. Well, if I put E into this, I'm not going to try to get the actual value. I just want to keep track of the sign. Square root of E, positive number. E is roughly 2.7. E to the third power, 2.7 to the third power, positive number. And then natural log of E is equal to 1. So what's in my parentheses is going to be equal to 1 minus 3 halves, negative number. So f prime of e is a negative number, and that means I'm going to be decreasing for this whole region on the right side. So that says, once I get past 1, my sequence is going to be monotonic decreasing. So that takes care of item 2. We're monotonic decreasing. For item 3, we're bounded below. We already saw that we're bounded below by 0. So how would I get bounded above? Well, let's take a look at the first couple points. When I'm at n equals 1, we already saw that we're going to get 0. When I'm at n equals 2, we're going to be decreasing after that. So the largest that this sequence can get is at n equals 2. If I put n equals 2 into the sequence, we're going to get natural log of n, 2 to the 3 halves over 2 to the 3 halves. And when you evaluate that, you get roughly 0.368. So we're bounded above by, say, 1. So this function's also bounded. Bounded below, bounded above. That takes care of all the items for this example.